you do. You have um, signed up for our, one of our webinars. It's the Healthy Virginia County webinar with the Virginia Department of Health and the Chickahominy Health District. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar. It's part of our 2018 Presidential Initiative on Community Health. Our goal is to better understand what goals have been set at the state level and how communities can assess their own strengths and needs as we all strive to improve the health of our county. My name is Sharon Alsop and I am the president of the Virginia Association of Counties and also a member of the Board of Supervisors in, in King and Queen County. Just a few little housekeeping items. Um, we ask that you place your phone on mute um, and um, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. If anyone would like to ask a question, you can type it in the box on your screen and um, I will then um, collect them and read them to the speakers. Um, today we have with us uh, Leslie Hodlin. She is an educator, researcher, and social change advocate. Dr. Hodlin has uh, dedicated her career to inspiring individuals communities and organizations to succeed through evidence-based policy system and environmental changes that improve quality of life. She is a leader who strongly values action and collaboration. Dr. Hudlin is passionate about public health research and promoting healthy environments to reduce and prevent the burden of disease. She supervises a team of 32 in the Office of Family Health Services Division of Population Health Data at the Virginia Department of Health in Richmond. In the division, she leads four epidemiology, data analysis, and program evaluation teams focused on maternal child health, prevention, and health promotion, Virginia Cancer Registry, and statewide surveys and assessments. She spends her spare time volunteering with girls' leadership organizations and raising five children with her husband, Todd. Our next speaker after her will be Dr. Uh, Thomas G. Frank. He works for the Virginia Department of Health as the director of the Chickasaw Health District, which includes the counties of Hanover, Richland, New Kent, and Charles City. He received his MD from the University of Virginia and his uh, Master's of Public Health from Virginia Commonwealth University. In addition to his public health job, he also serves as commander in the U.S. Navy Reserve, where he has been a flight surgeon for 28 years. Then we have Caitlin Hodge. Caitlin Re uh, Hodge received her Master of Public and Health uh, degree in 2010 from the University of Albany in New York. Prior to joining the Chippewa Health District, Caitlin was the Director of Diabetes Programs for all YMCA branches in Greater Richmond, where she planned, implemented, monitored, and evaluated diabetes prevention and diabetes control programs. Recently, Caitlin was uh, promoted from Health Educator Senior to Population Health Manager for the Chickahominy Health District. She leads the health to complete local community health assessments and community health improvement programs. There are several other people in the room if you want to introduce yourselves very quickly, um, and then we will start with the presentation. Yeah, Rich Williams, Director of Three Rivers Health District. Uh, Jeff Sue, Director of Public Health at the health department, currently serving as the acting deputy of the state area. Okay, and then. And I'm Bob Dix. I'm the deputy commissioner for community health services for the Virginia Department of Health. Okay, thank you all for coming and for being a part of this um, uh, webinar today. If we can uh, go ahead and we will um, ask Dr. Hoglin to kick off the pre with the presentation about the state's plan for well-being. Karen, thank you so much for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you um, what we're doing at the Virginia Department of Health. Um, I think before we get into the details of what's happening in our counties around the Commonwealth, um, it's important to understand population health and, and the plan for well-being. Um, it's incredibly exciting to watch a county take hold of this concept of transforming their population into a healthier one, um, and it comes to life in very actionable ways. Um, it requires a different way of thinking about our work, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean we change what we do, it's just we think more collectively about the impact that results from the work we do. So the plan for well-being puts an emphasis on alignment, clarity, and intentionality. And these watchwords really set the stage to focus on what we do to improve, improve the health for all, of all Virginians. 
Um, and there's certainly a role for everyone to play, and we want to move Virginia forward as being one of the healthiest or being the healthiest state in the nation. So population health uh, may be an unfamiliar term. Um, so what is population health? Um, for many, it might be an um, unfamiliar term, uh, but population health can be looked at as actually in a variety of ways depending on what setting or field that you work in. Uh, some view it as a framework for thinking about why some populations are healthier than others. Uh, some say it's the health outcomes of a group of specific individuals, and then the specific distribution and disparity of outcomes within that group. Others say it is the health of the population measured by health status indicators and influenced by social and personal health practices, individual capacity and coping skills, human biology, early childhood development, and the list goes on. Uh, but no matter the perspective, population health is the why behind what we do and how we do it. These definitions certainly underpin our core public health functions and how we perform them. So public health is what we do as a society collectively to assure conditions in which people can be healthy. So those are the organized community activities that we undertake to prevent, identify, and counter threats to the health of the public. Um, it's the services, the programs, the policy development, and implementation, the community health assessments, and health improvement planning um, that come out of the public health discipline. So the population health mindset and attitude is the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health, specifically through the integrated partnerships and leveraged resources. Simon Sinek, a leadership sponsor, has a book that says Start With Why. And our why is population health. It's the purpose that inspires us to think, act, and communicate differently about how we do our work. And it's also about keeping a strong focus on the shared goal that a population or a community, as it's defined, can improve in their health status and quality of life. So how do we get there? The pathways um, to population health um, include a number of things. First and foremost, first and foremost, health and well-being develop over a lifetime. Numerous studies have demonstrated that health and well-being of an individual begins forming before birth and develops throughout the life course, long before disease becomes manifest. Children who experience toxic levels of stress, for example, have a high have a dose dependent risk of developing poor health and life outcomes, with higher rates of cardiovascular disease, chronic disease, and poor social well being. Therefore, efforts to optimize health and well being at every stage of life can be cost effective in the long run. Social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And they enhance or impede the ability of individuals to attain their desired level of health or, social, or health opportunity. Social factors such as racism, social isolation, violence, inadequate housing, and adequate employment have a 50% higher contribution to poor health than premature death and health care access alone. It underscores the profound contribution of social factors in the lifelong development of health and well-being. The health and well-being and equity of people in the places where they live, learn, work, and play, and pray are interrelated and connected to the systems, the policies and infrastructure underlying um, where they live, in the place that they live. For example, children born in the same hospital who grew up two miles apart might have a 10 to 25 year difference in predicted life expectancy because of place-based determinants of health. Health inequities appear to arise in part from a series of place-based historical and structural factors such as redlining and zoning laws, which resulted in a lack of investment in places where communities of color frequently live. This meant that businesses could not get favorable loans and didn't invest in these areas because they were perceived to be too risky. Lack of business investment leads to fewer jobs, a poor tax base, poor schools, poor public and social services, and a host of conditions that lead to a poor health outcome. The current health system was originally developed to respond to a different set of health needs, primarily infection and injury, the leading causes of death in, in the early 1900s. However, as the demographics of the U.S. population has shifted substantially over time, so, have, so too have the prevailing health needs. 
today an aging population and rising rates of obesity, mental illness, chronic disease, and inequity are considerable drivers of health outcomes and costs. One in five people suffer from mental illness. Approximately 165,000 people have died from an opioid overdose since 1999. Two million people have, are currently suffering from opioid use disorder. By 2020, the cost of prediabetes and diabetes alone is projected to rise from $322 billion to $520 billion. Such trajectories in the health of populations cannot and should not be managed solely at the individual level. But so health systems are now learning to authentically partner to improve the health of individual patients and populations while proact proactively addressing the social, structural, and clinical drivers of poor health outcomes. So the most efficient, effective, and sustainable way to improve population health is for public health and healthcare systems to develop the infrastructure capacity and relationships to partner effectively with those who hold the other pieces. This means local government, social services, schools, churches, community development agencies, local businesses, the legal system, everyone. It takes time to develop this understanding along with trust, governance structures, and policies to create an integrated first endeavor. Interesting to note that when we talk about the health of the individual or the health of the population, it kind of can be broken down into these percentages. Um, most believe that health is related to health access, and that's really only 20%, the clinical medical um, application of a person's um, or a population's ability to be healthy is, is only in that field. 70% are the individual health behaviors and social and economic based factors um, that allow a person in a population um, to be healthy um, and to have the services and resources available to them um, to make those right choices, those healthy choices by default. When we talk about investment in health um, from a cost perspective, 95% um, go into medical services, um, whereas 5% uh, is directed towards preventive and proactive population health approaches for health improvement. At the Virginia Department of Health, we set up a phased approach to help our local health districts partnering with their health systems, um, their hospitals, and their local governments and other partners in the community um, to focus on three main phases that they begin to uncover what the true health needs are and health priorities are in their community that need to be improved. Um, and the first phase focuses on creating a shared ownership um, by developing a strong team um, that's diverse from community uh, representatives. Um, there's a leadership um, structure and goals and objectives that have been identified and a commitment to using known and, and well-researched methods and resources to continue the process uh, forward. The second phase focuses on completing a community health assessment, which includes collecting data, analyzing the data, ranking the health priorities, developing the document and communication, and then turning that into recommendations for health improvement. So identifying the objectives and goals and the measures in which will be improved. The last phase is on sustainability of that collaborative effort. Uh, we view the community health assessment, health improvement planning process as a continuum. Uh, it's not a one and done. Uh, we want to see sustainability of the relationships as well as the commitment and the involvement from the community in that partnership. Um, to be recruiting new partners and resources, to thinking about when you hit a goal, then what's the next thing that needs to be prioritized, and continuing to move forward so that the quality of life for those, um, the populations and the communities of interest um, is seen and observed. I mentioned collecting data, which is extremely important. And so we have a data page on the Virginia Department of Health website. And if you go to the main website, cdh.virginia.gov, there will be a data tab at the top. When you click on that, it'll bring you to this portal page. Um, we believe that making high value health data more accessible to everyone um, is essential to bettering health outcomes for all. Uh, we recognize that we need to provide timely, reliable, granular, and actionable data to help communities make great decisions. Um, 
and those metrics um, can help document um, prevention initiatives and certainly when we target certain social determinants of health and focus on health, health equity. So as you can see on the page, there's a number of different topics um, where data is available. And at the very bottom, if it's not um, a part of the portal, uh, there are, it's a link to other sources and reports. We highly encourage you to take a look at your county um, and the data uh, and where your counties uh, rank in terms of certain health indicators. So just real quickly, this is the population health impact continuum. Uh, as you can tell, it ranges from 1 to 10, and we really are, are enabling and empowering our local health districts to move towards that collective impact side of the continuum, where they're convening a group of leaders from all levels and all sectors to improve specific outcomes. These are not one-off things. These are ongoing collaborative efforts uh, where their focus is on uh, practices that get results and constantly show improvement. There's an action plan and advocates for that plan to put their practices to work. So the plan for well-being is owned and shared by all of us, and it gives a foundation for all of us to have a healthy life. I mentioned something earlier about the health opportunity. Health, we have a health opportunity index also on our website that is put out by the Office of Health Equity. Um, and these are the highlighted areas of the Commonwealth where there's very low or low health opportunity. So the likelihood of someone to living a healthy life is going to be lower in these areas. Um, and as you can tell, there's a lot of work we still have to do. Um, and we are highly encouraging partnerships and collaborations and uh, merged efforts um, in working with the same populations uh, in these areas. The Health Opportunity Index is an indices made up of 13 different uh, measures from education to poverty to transportation to food access and others. There are four main aims of the Virginia's Plan for Well-Being. Healthy connected communities, strong start for children, preventive actions, and system of health care. In healthy connected communities, health has to be factored into the broader policy decisions. So as counties think about land use, economic development, and transportation, education, employment, and housing, and public safety, the health impact should always be considered. Certainly investing in Virginia's children is important from birth to grave, we want the life force to be as strong as possible. In terms of prevention, we need to move toward the culture of keeping people healthy first before disease or injury arises. And certainly creating a stronger connected system of health care can be an improvement for everyone. You can go to virginiawellbeing.com to find more about the Virginia Plan for Wellbeing and how it might apply to your locality. Peter Drucker says, and for certain, without an action plan or improvement plan, we become a prisoner of events. And without checking to re-examine the plan as events unfold, we have no way of knowing which events really matter and which are only noise. Doing this work requires a comfort with some ambiguity and uncertainty. And that's not always easy when we're working to improve population health. Deciding the health priorities that affect your communities of interest can be complicated especially when those partners around the table come with their own plans and views. Population health improvement is not a linear process, and often resources and partners do not materialize like we wish. So we must value our partners' input and seek solutions that build on the strengths of those partnerships. Decision-making belongs to the group agency, or not one, sorry, decision-making belongs to the group, not to one person, agency, or sector. The collective process may make the outcomes uncertain without a shared vision or goal. So we have to remember that alignment, clarity, and intentionality will establish working relationships that are sustainable. So I'm excited to turn it over to Dr. Frank so that they can talk about how they've implemented uh, these processes and thought improvement in their, in his district. <laughs> The 
caller um, changing seats, um, uh, and she's uh, um, we're pulling up the next uh, presentation. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Huffman uh, one, one question, and it says, um, how many other states have done something similar to this? Do we know? Uh, there's quite a few that have their own types of plans. Um, Ours is unique because it was created at a state level with multiple state partners, um, and so it's not going to look the same as another state. But um, certainly there are examples in Maryland, Colorado, Michigan, et cetera, that, done the same. that have done similar processes. Yes. And I think one of the um, other ones is people want your want to know if they can get a transcript of your notes. <laughs> oh, sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we have what that. Uh, well, I can provide that. They, Okay, they can we'll send we'll, uh, send those those out to uh, those that, that attended. Okay, we can move on to the next presentation. Great. Uh, my name is Tom Frank, and once again, I'm the health director for Chickahominy Health District. I wanted to just thank you all for inviting us here to the table to present on population health. Uh, it's truly an honor to be able to share that with you all, and, uh, and it tells us that you all really have your heart in in the community's well-being, the community's health. So I just wanted to thank you once again. Um, and, and I realize this is a one-way conversation and I can't hear all you folks out there uh, because you've been muted. But if, if I don't speak loud enough, uh, somebody could just type in, uh, please speak up. And if I'm speaking too loud, just type in the, uh, on, the on your uh, computer, just, just type in, tone it down, please. <laughs> so either way, we can communicate that way if we can't communicate verbally. Um, I, I know that somebody uh, did communicate, it's hard to hear. So I'm going to try to speak up a little bit if, if I can. I know the speakers are in the ceiling where we are. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do, my objective is to just relate to you a little bit about what local health departments do and what we're all about. And uh, because I had heard that that was one of the uh, one of the aims that you all wanted to get out of this presentation. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin Hodge, who's the population health manager at Chickahominy Health District. And Caitlin's going to uh, describe to you uh, how we've addressed population health at the local level and describe one of the uh, community health assessments that have been done in Hanover County. So to get started with, what I like to usually do to my, with my audiences when I'm talking about public health, I first like to just outline what does public health look like in Virginia, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, uh, and here on this slide, hopefully you can see uh, how public health is, is organized, at least geographically, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. <clears throat> you can see here, uh, this is color-coded into 35 health districts. And I'll, I'll, I should start off by telling you that in Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, public health is really uh, uh, administered by the state. It's a state-administered program. Other states have a different way of administering their public health. Uh, some of them are shared with the state in the uh, health department. Uh, but in the Commonwealth of Virginia, it's, it's more or less organized uh, as a state-administered program. The state is divided into 35 health districts, and those health districts are further divided into 119 or so local health departments based on their jurisdictions. And, um, and I would say that there are a couple of exceptions to the rule of, uh, of, of state-administered programs. There's actually two, I believe there's two, Bob, uh, that are locally administered public health systems. That would be Arlington and Fairfax, I believe. And uh, and also one caveat, another caveat is uh, some of our health districts have been combined, and so you'll have two health districts that are really being administered uh, by one one management team. And so we've had a couple of combinations there, uh, but more or less we have 35 districts, 119 jurisdictions, that each of which has a local health department. So I hope that paints a little bit of a picture of. of Geographically, what public health looks like in Virginia. Um, now, from a from a functional standpoint, what is it that public health does? Uh, this is a this is a pic picture of a model that was developed. Uh, really came out of 1988. I believe it was 1988 Institute of Medicine report on the future of public health, which kind of led to some changes in public health, and uh, which led to this committee meeting in 1994 and putting out this this model of what it is that, that public health actually does. And it's divided into 10 essential, what they call public health services. Um, I don't really like the term services. I, I, it's really 10 essential public health functions or 10 essential public health responsibilities. Um, and you can, you can read those. Um, and these are things that we do all the time in public health. And it is a cycle so that 
you know, if we begin with monitoring the health of, the, of our people, our community, uh, and then we diagnose and investigate, not like a physician does with a patient diagnosing and investigating an individual, but diagnosing and investigating a population of people or a defined community of people. Um, and then we, we inform, educate, and empower. We mobilize community partnerships. Uh, we go on to develop policies or work with the jurisdictions to develop policies. Uh, of course, there's always laws and regulations that we're responsible for in public health. Uh, we, we help we try to help link people to providers where that's out there. Um, we assure a competent workforce amongst ourselves. And then we go back and we start evaluating. And that leads us right back into the monitoring health and diagnosis again. So this is a continuous cycle. It's, it, it's somewhat abstract picture here of what public health does. I, like, I would rather simplify it. And the way I would simplify it is to say that uh, what we really do is we, we plan we uh, enact and then we assess what we've done. And you, you've heard uh, some people use plan, act, do, or plan, do, assess, cycle, and we just continuously repeat that cycle over and over. Um, so on a more, a little bit more practical level, I want to show you what public health does at my health district. So this is a local health district called Chickahominy Health District. Um, we have four local health departments. And I've, I've broken up some of the uh, some of the programs we're responsible for at the local public health level um, into into three categories here. Just that's arbitrary, um, and and there are a lot more programs that we do than these. These are just some of the core ones, and um, and I like to lay these out. And then uh, and I would say that all the health districts out there, the 35 health districts, there's probably a 90 to 95 percent correlation here. They, they cover the same program with a couple of exceptions here and there, depending on which district you're looking at. Some of them might not have maternity health, for example, uh, or they might not do maternity, direct maternity care, although they will work on maternity, maternal child health. So there are some minor differences, but in general, you, you look at this and you're, you're probably looking at 90 to 95 percent of health districts that are out there. And I, to start with, I would say that your, your average citizen and county administrator and county official understands that public health does immunizations and we hold nursing clinics and, uh, and other clinics in the areas of family planning and STDs to control sexually transmitted infections. And we, uh, we generally administer WIC programs out of our offices. Um, uh, you may not know that we do rabies control on the human level, but we do that. Um, some citizens might not know some of the environmental health programs that we are responsible for, although most county officials understand this because they deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so you, you might understand that public health is responsible for food safety in our restaurants and other eating establishments. We're responsible for the proper uh, the proper conduct of planning for septic systems, on-site septic systems, and we're responsible for the safety of drinking water. Uh, typically, that's a, that's more of a state level uh, function, uh, but we also do uh, at the local level. We're responsible for private wells when there's an issue uh, when uh, when wells are being developed. Uh, those wells need to be looked at and, and reviewed by us by our environmental health services specialists. Um, we're responsible for uh, certain aspects of the sanitation of hotels, motels, and marinas, as well as swimming pools. Um, and then under the environmental health umbrella, we're responsible for rabies control when it comes to animals, rabies in animals. You know, rabies in humans. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> very, uh, very timely. Uh, rabies control in animals and rabies control in humans kind of goes hand in hand, and we, our nurses work together with our environmental health services specialists to handle a rabies control and make sure that nobody's going to get rabies in the community. Um, and then there's, you know, under this new category uh, called population health. Uh, this is a new one I created. I didn't have that when I first came uh, to Chickahominy in 2013. Um, I used to just call it the category of special programs. Uh, but now I'm calling it population health, or you can call it community outreach or community health. But it really it includes these other things that we're responsible for that really affect uh, an entire community or a population of people, and that that would include disaster preparedness or emergency preparedness and response. Uh, how some people still remember uh, epidemiology, uh, 
the, uh, the study and investigation of diseases out in the community, uh, community outreach and education efforts, disease prevention efforts, uh, and then more recently uh, put their CHAWs and CHIPS. The CHAW standing for Community Health Assessment, and CHIPS, which stands for Community Health Improvement Plan. And then, and then I put et cetera because there's a lot of other programs that could fall under this umbrella of population health. So these, this is just to help you understand some of the programs that we do at the local health department level. Uh, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk to you about some of the uh, some of the data and the health outcomes that we are interested in uh, at the local health department level. So if you uh, is this. I hope that you can read this clearly. Some of the some of the fonts a little bit small, but this uh, this slide here shows you the leading causes of death in the United States, and this data is from 2000. So you have to remember it's a little maybe a little bit outdated, but it's the latest that I could find a good graphic on. So in 2000, the leading causes of death in the United States were heart disease, cancer, and stroke, the top three, followed by uh, lower respiratory disease, unintentional injuries, diabetes, pneumonia, and influenza, Alzheimer's disease, and kidney disease. Now I can tell you that, that, that those percentages are shifting, and we're starting to see Alzheimer's disease move up the ladder there to become more and more prevalent. And we're also starting to see a shift in cancer becoming more common and heart disease actually going down, such that in, if you look at Virginia, that's actually flipped. And in Virginia, cancer is now the leading cause of death, and heart disease is number two now. So they've actually split just the last few years. However, so in public health, we're not only interested in looking at these, these final health outcomes or these diagnoses that physicians will label their patients with. Um, what we really want to know is, well, why did this person get heart disease? Why did this person develop cancer? Why did this person develop stroke? What are the underlying causes that led to these, these diagnoses, these leading causes of death? And so when you, when you look on the right side of the picture here, on the right side, you'll see the actual causes of death in the United States from the same study in the year 2000. Uh, so if you, if you look at the underlying causes, and that's the reason why did this person uh, develop heart disease, cancer, or stroke, then another pattern emerges here, and that is uh, number one, in 2000, number one was tobacco, number two was poor diet and physical inactivity, and number three was alcohol consumption, followed by the others that you can read there. Now again, these numbers are from 2000, and you know, from what I've been reading, the research seems to be showing that we're starting to see poor diet and physical inactivity start to overtake tobacco as the actual leading cause of death in the United States. And so there's, there's there are some changes going on as, as we get more and more people to quit smoking cigarettes, and, uh, and that has happened over the last 20 years. We're starting to see uh, other underlying causes rise to the top. Now, we don't stop there. We don't want to just stop there and say, well, now we kind of understand the actual causes of death, but what if we go and we ask our why again? Um, <clears throat> always ask why, and then you ask is that why, why, why did that happen? We um, as we did our community health assessments, um, you may hear a little bit about this from Caitlin, but we did this process called root cause analysis. And it's really uh, it's just a series of asking why. <clears throat> why did this happen? And why did that happen? And why did that happen? And you want to get down to the underlying root causes. Um, and it, you know, this is extremely important. And no matter what endeavor you're doing, it's, it's what made Toyota famous. Uh, you might have heard about the five whys. Uh, I believe that came from, from uh, the founder of Toyota, who had established a series of quality assurance and total quality improvement processes. And one of them was asking the five whys. And he, he asked his people, well, why, why did this uh, go wrong? Why did, why did this uh, piece of this automobile fail? Well, why did that happen? And why did that happen? Get down to the root cause, and you can make a much bigger impact on, on your community. So that's what we did. Um, so if you actually, if you look at tobacco and physical inactivity, poor diet, alcohol consumption, and all of these others, and you ask, well, why? What is it underlying that 
might really be causing, uh, contributing to these factors and causing some of these things to happen. Well, you've already seen, uh, Leslie presented an infographic that says the same thing as this. Uh, her infographic may be a little bit prettier. This is just a pie chart, but it says the same thing. And that is, when you look at what actually contributes, what are the factors that actually contribute to uh, health outcomes? Uh, this is really what, what we found in, uh, at least in one study, and I know other studies have backed this up, uh, but you know, genetic causes, you know, some people are born with genetic conditions, and no matter what they do, that genetic condition is going to lead to certain outcomes. Uh, Down syndrome would be one example of many. So genetics might contribute about 10% to health, uh, to that impact health. Uh, clinical care or medical care, 10%. Um, when you look at the environment, environmental uh, causes or environmental factors, 10%. When you look at health behaviors, you see a bigger chunk, a much bigger impact of 30%. And then uh, health behaviors are related to things like smoking cigarettes, whether or not you exercise regularly, uh, what kind of foods do you eat, what kind of nutrition do you get in your diet, uh, so health behaviors, which you saw on, on, that, on that last uh, slide. And then finally, uh, the most impactful is social, socioeconomic factors, 40% impact. <clears throat> and so, with this, as we do our root cause analysis, this is really the, the type of data that we want to get at. We want to figure out what are the health behaviors and what are the social and economic factors that are underlying a population that are contributing to people's lifestyle choices and contributing ultimately to their health outcomes. So uh, here's just another way to look at it. This is uh, this is just a different way of looking at really the same thing. My, in my view. I believe this was developed by Dr. Frieden at the CDC. Uh, Dr. Frieden came up with this model. Uh, here it's, it's more of a pyramid model where you see the largest impact on factors that affect health. The largest impact are the things that you see on the bottom of the pyramid, the foundation. And then as you go up the pyramid, uh, it, these things have a smaller and smaller impact on the ultimate health. So you see, uh, you see there at the bottom again, socioeconomic factors. Number one, again, we said we said roughly 40 percent effect on ultimate health outcomes. Further up, further up that pyramid, you'll see uh, changing the context. Uh, basically, that means thing, uh, policies and uh, things that you can do that make individuals default to these decisions healthier. And they give you some examples there on the right. Um, one example would be fluoridation of the water in our drinking water. Uh, there are a lot of people who were opposed to that when that first when that law first was established. Um, there are people now who are still wondering about that and, and concerned about fluoridation. But that fluoridation is a thing is a uh, decision that that we made uh, at the regulatory level. It's a law that we basically we enforced on people and. It, most people don't really have a choice. But because of it, it's led to improved health outcomes. It's led to fluoridation, uh, better dental outcomes for, for children, for example. Another example is uh, the tobacco tax. Some, some states tax the tobacco more than others, and when they, where you see states taxing their tobacco more, you see lower rates of smoking, for example. So that's changing the context. Uh, the next level is long-lasting protective interventions, uh, kind of like prevention interventions, such as colonoscopy, immunization, receiving your vaccine. And then you move up to the smaller impacts, and you get to things like clinical interventions, um, and finally counseling and education. So these are the things that take place in your doctor's office or your counselor's office. These are the individual one-on-one -on -one interactions with, with your provider. And if you ask the medical care community, the private medical offices and private providers, physicians and nurse practitioners and others and counselors, you might, they may, uh, they may uh, have an issue with this and they may say, well, I think what we do is a lot more important than just 10% of health outcomes. So anyway, this, this is the data. The data kind of points towards about a 10% effect.
Why do I show this? By the way, you, you put this up there. Um, I do that to, so that we can focus our efforts when it comes to community health assessment and community health improvement planning, uh, strategic planning. You want to you want to put your money where you're going to have the most bang for your buck. Correct. So we most of us most of us subscribe to the uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, um, and I think that's definitely true. So where do you want to put your funding? Do you want to put your funding in prevention? Where do you want to put your funding in, in curing disease once it's happened? Uh, those are important. You have to have both. You have a good healthcare system in your society. Um, but we need to rethink about where we're putting our funding. Uh, as you all know, you know Medicaid, Medicaid expansion has got us through. That's a lot of money. You know, we're talking, I don't know how many billion, $40 billion a year, perhaps, uh, for the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's, that's a lot of money. <clears throat> so I, I pose the question, where do you want, where should we be putting that money? Is there any way in Medicaid that we can make sure that some of that money gets put to prevention efforts uh, and maybe looking at some of the, some of the larger impact on this foundational pyramid here? Just a question I would cross the people. Um, Finally, I'm going to circle on back to this, this idea of population health. Uh, so, you know, what is public health versus community health versus population health? Uh, there are a lot of definitions out there, and if you ask different groups of people, they're going to tell you different things. They're going to define population health differently. Um, we've heard we've heard Leslie give a, a formal definition of public health of, of population health, um, you know, from, from at the state level, and. Um, if you ask Dr. Rich Williams here, uh, he's here. He's the director of Three Rivers Health District. Dr. Williams was formerly the head of the health system at NASA. And so Dr. Williams, his, his definition of population health was, in 1969. So his population of people are all of the employees of NASA, which is a huge system, and he's he's going to address that population health in a maybe a different, somewhat different manner, but using the same tools that we use in the community. As well, so depending on who you ask, if you ask me uh, as a local public health um, director, you know, I'm going to lump all this together. I, I kind of look at public health and community health and population health as being almost synonymous, and, and I just like things to be simple, and that's how I simplify it. They're very synonymous because ultimately we're all aiming for the same thing. We want to do the most good for the most people, given the limited amount of resources that we have. You know, we have a finite number of resources, financial and people and, and other. And how do we take those resources and do the most good for the most people? That's the aim of all of this, public, whether it's public health or population health or community health. Um, and ultimately, our, our mission is to improve the health of the community. And we all share that common mission. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin Hodge. And uh, Caitlin is going to talk about how we uh, have taken uh, public health and population health and have applied it at the local level in the county of Hanover. I'll, we'll be happy to answer your questions that you pose. Uh, if, if you'll just write them down, I think we'll get to your questions at the end here. All right, thank you. This is Caitlin Hodge. Um, so I led our process in Hanover County to complete our community health assessment. I'm going to focus uh, my examples on the part in this uh, visual here that's the red circle. So the community health assessment, I'll go through kind of what's included in that, and we also set priorities in this first part. You see that leads into the next part, the uh, green circle, the community health improvement plan. We're um, currently in that stage right now in Hanover County where we're determining activities, deciding on our goals, and we're going to be um, uh, deciding on an evaluation plan. Um, so one important thing that just we like to repeat um, that I'm echoing in both presentations is that this is a cyclical in nature. You're never really finished. Communities are always changing. Um, you have, that really requires new and improved strategies to meet new challenges. And um, so our vision statement for our community health assessment process was to have every child and adult have the opportunity to reach their full potential and best quality of life in our community. Um, so we did this process, it kicked off in April 2017, 
our um, report, our community health assessment report was published in March of this year, and we started our community health improvement planning session in um, February, and we just had our last session in June um, with our steering committee. So this is a list of who participated in the Hanover County Steering Committee for the community health assessment. Um, this is not uh, what every single steering committee will look like in each county. Um, everyone's will be a little bit different, but the main takeaway here is that you want it to be diverse. You want lots of different stakeholders, different perspectives and backgrounds. It's great to have um, county agency leadership uh, uh, encourage their um, members to join. And um, we pulled a lot of our membership for the steering committee from our Healthy Hanover Coalition. That coalition started in 2014 because the county had it as part of their strategic plan. So that was a wonderful introduction to the health department since we're leading that coalition. And you'll see here that members represented government agencies, our local hospital system, um, or one of our local hospital systems, not for profit community, the public schools, our local college, as, as many others. And then just so you know, to define a couple of these, um, the Arc of Kindle Frame, they share people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, circles action, they work with um, families who are trying to change their financial wellness. They pair them up with mentors and um, provide a lot of education to help them set goals about poverty. Um, Hanover Cares is a coalition that focuses on youth and teens to prevent substance abuse. And Hanover Safe Place works with uh, survivors of domestic violence. So this is a kind of busy slide, but the main takeaway is that in Hanover County, we collected data in these major categories, the ones that are underlined. So um, in demographics, socioeconomic factors, health status and outcomes, healthcare community resources, the physical environment, as well as behavior, health behaviors. And as uh, Dr. Frick mentioned, these are weighted differently on how they impact a community's health. Um, so each locality will likely modify or change what indicators they want included. We base this off of a set that's recommended when doing a comprehensive health assessment, but we added and, and focused on different pieces based on what the steering committee wanted to learn. So for example, um, we're right now working on a community health assessment in Goochland County, and they wanted to add in learning about um, information on internet access as a piece of physical environment because they're in such a rural county. So that's a, uh, an element that's not in Hanover, but we can definitely add for future for future review. Um, also, like more communities are becoming interested in learning about opioids and addiction, so that might have a greater focus in the future. Um, one really important part of a community health assessment is qualitative data collection. So there's statistics and numbers, but the part that really kind of engages your community members and gives them excited to be involved is collecting information on people's attitudes and perspectives and opinions about the health and wellness of their community. So these are four examples of how we collected that information that I'm going to highlight. We used other methods as well, but I thought for a sake of time I'd give you these examples. Um, outside of these, um, communities might do things like focus groups or an online survey or a town hall, um, but this is what our steering committee um, thought we should focus so the first example is our um, asset listing. So sometimes people do asset mapping. Um, we did it in this listing format. So this is a busy slide, so I apologize. But the main takeaway is um, our very first meeting of our community health assessment steering team in Hanover was to identify what already exists as a strength in our community. So what organizations, resources, people, and places already contribute to making the county a healthy place to live, work, and play. And so uh, an example of those are listed there on the far left column. You'll see things like the free place, the library, um, Parks and Rec, Randolph Macon College, the fact that there are rural and open spaces and senior connections. Then we decided to categorize into how do we promote wellness. So you'll see across the top there, we have social, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, environmental neighborhoods, education, occupation, and economic. Those are all different dimensions of wellness. And then the committee decided where the X's should go. So you'll see at the very bottom how um, Senior Connections has an X in every single dimension of wellness. That's because the Senior Committee believes, based on their programs and mission, 
um, and impact on the community that they should um, have an axe in every single dimension. So the way we use this is to look at overall the number of assets per dimension of wellness to see where we were focusing a lot of our resources. So you'll see that physical wellness had 25 assets, whereas um, mental and emotional wellness had 10. And it's really important to remember that this is based on the steering committee and what they thought about each of those resources on the program. And this is a living document and it should always be updated. Things change, these programs are available, but one of the main takeaways was there wasn't as much in our county currently for mental, emotional wellness as well as um, economical. Um, for our photo voice project, this is a way that we engaged with um, young adults and teenagers. We reached out to our local college as well as the high school students and asked them to participate in photo voice. So we um, did a training for them and then we uh, had them go out and take pictures of things that promote or hinder health and then they uh, described why they took those pictures. So they attended the training, you know, we went over safety tips with them and then they submitted uh, photos of write up. So this is just one example from a college student. She labeled this uh, photo horse tails. And she said, um, at checkpoint one, horse professionals and mental health professionals work together to provide a healing space for people with mental health issues, primarily vet uh, veterans. This is a great, positive program and definitely promotes health. Mental health is just as important as physical health. So a lot of the people on the stage team didn't even know that checkpoint one existed in the county, which was fascinating. Um, and we got a lot of interesting feedback, and a lot of them focused on assets in the community. So this is a great way to get input from younger folks. Another wonderful project we did that I would love to share more details um, on if anyone's interested is uh, we collected um, walking audits. And this is part of a small grant we received for the health department from America Walk and the Lakeshore Foundation called Designing for Inclusive Health. And we partnered with the Arc of Hanover, which I mentioned, they provide services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have a focus group with those participants and their family members. We learned from them, where are you currently walking or biking right now? Because they, they're unable to drive themselves in a personal vehicle. And then from their feedback, we mapped out seven segments of roads to audit. And we did that um, in partnership with the town and county planners. And then we had 14 volunteers help with auditing these segments of roads and score them on their walkability and their safety and inclusiveness for people with multiple ability levels. So these are just two pictures that were taken from that project. We actually made a whole uh, video. If you have time to watch it, I can share it. And it's about 10 minutes long that goes over the whole project. Um, so kind of looking at this regionally as well, we didn't want to ignore, while we are doing our handover assessment, what's going on in the region. So Bon Secours has multiple counties with the hospital system served. So we made sure to review their community health needs assessment that they did um, in 2016. And part of that was an online survey where they asked um, several county residents to um, select their top five, actually top ten priorities. So these are their top five. And you'll see they have mental health, transportation, jobs with fair wages, access to health services, and education in their top five. And I have a link there if you want to uh, review their needs assessment in, in full. Um, when we were looking at this, we knew that Hanover County only represented a small uh, number of responses to this. So we wanted to make sure that we took this type of question out into our community. So um, our steering committee did a multi-voting process, which has three stages of voting on priorities. And Kind of a longer explanation, so I'll just give you the final outcomes. But the last part of it was to, from their top five health priorities in Hanover County, choose their top three. And so that's shown here with the yellow highlight. And so what we did is we took those top three health priorities and we brought them out to the Hanover County community. So you'll see those are transportation, mental health, and poverty. Poverty we rephrased to be financial instability. People really connected more with that concept because they didn't identify as being in poverty as stigmatizing, but they identified as having financial instability. Um, so we used to call community input sessions, but you might see them called um, community listening sessions. And we used uh, a problem importance worksheet that was developed by Nietzsche. And then we um, tweaked 
changed it a little bit so that it had um, different levels of reading, which was more accessible. And we added a comment section. So the steering committee um, wanted us to bring these worksheets about the three different main priority issues to the locations listed here. Um, they wanted that because they want to hear directly from those who may be facing these barriers to good health but may also be less likely to make their voice heard or complete an online survey like the ones we've run before. So we went to the Shady Grove High Methodist Church. We went there twice during their free clinic, and we talked one-on-one -on -one in the waiting room with patients and had them complete the worksheet. Um, we also went to two Head Start orientations and talked to parents about these issues and had them do the worksheets as well. And we also went to Circles Ashland, which I mentioned earlier, um, worked with people to help them set goals to change their financial stability. Um, and so we got a lot of amazing feedback. And uh, the worksheets have them score the importance on a 1 to 30 scale. And all of these issues scored in the high 20s, and they were all one point apart from each other, the so transportation, mental health, and financial stability. So they all scored very high. We also analyzed participants' comments um, using a software tool called Amiibo. And that was one of the best parts, was that we added that comment section so they could give examples of the challenges they were facing in real life. Um, so to wrap up this example from Hanover, we made this um, infographic with the help of um, our central office. And you'll see there are two people. They're on a row. They're going the same distance. The person on the right side has a lot more barriers to get over to get to the end. So you'll see there's a big boulder, there's a hurdle, and there's a brick wall. But the person on the left has fewer barriers. And so you're thinking the end is, you know, good help. So we want to focus on getting our clean health improvement planning process in our county, transportation barriers and safety. And this is just some supporting evidence for why these were chosen. Um, another part of our process that we did was a bike walk Hanover survey. We did that in partnership with the planning department. Um, I didn't go into detail on that, but I'm happy to share. Um, but you'll see that a large percentage of people felt that it was unsafe on the road to walk on their bike. Um, and then there's a quote here from one of our community input sessions where they're talking about how elderly and people who don't drive suffer from not being able to get to important appointments. But we also like to point out that um, in the town of Ashland, they've adopted complete street policy into their comprehensive plan, which means that moving forward, they're always going to consider multimodal transportation and not just personal vehicles. Um, the county is considering adopting a chapter that's similar and has some language about um, the next one is mental health care access and affordability. Um, some of the data that stood out to our steering committee were that there aren't that many health care providers in the, in the county of Hanover compared to Virginia's average. And that um, one of the key indicators in mental health is uh, self-harm or suicide. And we saw that there were more deaths related to suicide in our county compared to Virginia's average. And um, one amazing thing that happened as we were completing our health assessment process in Hanover County was that the Community Services Board started having same-day access. So that was really a highlight um, when we were talking about this and seeing this as a health priority that people who come to the Community Services Board for a mental health issue or for substance abuse or for a disability assistance, they had an appointment that same day. They didn't have to come back two weeks later. And lastly, um, challenges due to financial instability. So, Hanover County is considered wealthy compared to some of our neighboring counties in the region, but there are still areas where residents are living below the federal poverty line. And so poverty is a key driver of health status, and um, a lot of people who we talk to in the community know that. You know, that's a fact. They understand that completely. And um, one, one individual during the community input session said, people in the county who are in poverty feel invisible, and that was really striking to us. And, you know, poverty is a very complex issue, um, but one part of it is housing, affordable housing. And so we learned that Habitat for Humanity was starting neighborhood revitalization projects. So they weren't just building new homes, but they were revitalizing current homes. And we really wanted to highlight that as a wonderful way to help people with financial stability issues related to their housing. Um, so a main takeaway, I would say, is that um, you really want to take action in a collaborative way, um, you really need to work together to break down these barriers and have a diverse group of partners and leaders. Um, the, the 
places we need to focus on. Um, it's true in every community that there is a need for this space. And so um, it really takes a lot of great programs and policies and activities working together to get them going. Um, if you'd like to see our report online, I have the link there um, for the Chicomany uh, local health department and health district. And then Dr. Drake's my um, email address. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we got we received a, quite a bit of information. Um, I know that we're going a little bit over time. We invited everybody for our, to well, we decided to, to have lunch with us, and we've gone a little bit over time, but we started a little bit late. So um, right now I'm looking at um, questions, and I will start off because I always have questions. Um, and um, I think my first question, um, I'll go for uh, go back to uh, Dr. Um, Hoglin because um, uh, was. Um, Sort of, when are you expecting to update the, the whole um, plan for that, uh, that you have laid out? Is it, I know that it was supposed to be up to 2020. I'm not sure when you're going to look at it again. So we're, we're in process now for planning mm -hmm. uh, to, for the next iteration. Um, and uh, we're currently in a statewide assessment of population specifically for uh, Title V maternal child health. Um, that will sort of be leveraged into the statewide health assessment that then will inform the next plan as well. And I my uh, question for uh, Dr. Frank and uh, Ms. Hodge is, um, was, it, was there anything when you all were looking at Hanover and doing their assessment that really surprised you, um, that caught you kind of, you know, off guard? The first thing that surprised me was, was finding these pockets of poverty, and because we all, most of us uh, look at Hanover statistics, we would see an affluent county that's growing well and bringing in new businesses and uh, new neighborhoods popping up there nice. So we found we found that there were very specific pockets of poverty in, in well-defined areas that we were able to identify. And uh, and the other was the uh, just a comment from that one citizen that uh, pe people who um, people who are poor or can't afford things often are invisible. To the community, and that, that has struck me, and it's never left my mind since I saw that written down in our community health assessment. Uh, because people, people like that, uh, they feel invisible, and probably one of the reasons they feel invisible is that everybody looks at Hanover as an affluent county. Well, it's not. It's not completely affluent, and that, so I think poor people who live in affluent counties are probably at a, more of a disadvantage in certain ways than a poor person living in a poor county. Because at least uh, the poor counties are recognized as poor counties. And they tend to receive more attention, they tend to receive more funding through grants. Uh, whereas in Hanover, I, I found in my experience, it's been very, very difficult to land grants, to be awarded grants. And partly maybe because uh, we are, as a whole, we're doing pretty well. I think one of the things when you were, um, Showing your diet, the uh, you had one diagram where you were showing the causes of death, and I was looking at that. And, you know, you had cancer, and then you know, and then you said you asked why, 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 and you got sort of the other list. And I still noticed. I, I, I'm thinking it's because of the year it was, because I noticed that um, uh, addictions or you know uh, were lower on the list than I really would have expected them to be. Yeah, and and I think you're right. I, I think what we've seen in recent years is that uh, deaths due to what they call illicit drug use or deaths due to uh, opioid overdoses have risen really exponentially in the last two or three years. Um, it's gone up exponentially. And hopefully it's going to last year when we get the final 2017 results. Um, and maybe in 2018, maybe it will start leveling off. But, but I think uh, opioid, that's why opioid is considered an epidemic now, is opioid overdose. Um, but you're right, these statistics are changing over time. Um, I mentioned the tobacco statistics. Um, I think from what I read, tobacco has been overtaken by uh, poor nutritional choices and physical inactivity as the new number one underlying cause of death. And opioid overdose is rising, um, and it has be, really has become the most common cause of unintentional accidental death for youth in our society. One of the things that um, I've been talking to our health uh, district bringing in the uh, REVOD program. Anyone want to expand on that and, and how that can help the community? Yep, absolutely. Uh, we're very involved with Revod. Caitlin can tell you a little bit more about it. We partner together, Caitlin and I uh, partner with the CSDs and some of the other organizations. 
Kim, do you want to just start? So one part of doing these student input sessions and also being doing a health assessment as a whole is that you meet other community partners. And so during this assessment process, um, we got to know different coalitions and uh, uh, partners with them to hold community revised training. So not only for um, community service for patients, but also having them at the libraries and just opening up to the community to come and coordinating those at different times on the weekends and the evenings and making sure that people know that they can come and get, get the training. Um, the revive is uh, to it's a late we have a late person training to um, teach you what to do if there's an emergency and someone's overdose and how to respond to an opioid and um, the health department has um, naloxone you know the or the name brand is Narcan that um, we can prescribe once someone's been revived trained. So that's been a really great way to at least help people at the end. You know, it's not a preventative, but it's preventing death. It's not preventing addiction, but it's a way to help someone have another chance. So we partnered with um, several coalitions as well as community services boards. And as a whole, does the health department work with the community services board? I mean, what we're seeing in my um, community is more of a saying of, okay, they've got mental health problems that you're adding to their regular health, you know, physical health problems. And so I see those as sort of marrying up and having to work together. Yeah, yeah I would say that it's really, um, in, the, in previous years, we've always we've, we've been talking about partnering up, how can we, how can we mer merge some of our um, our ideas in treating mental health? Because we all know that physical health problems almost always have some mental health component to it, um, or a good proportion of them do. And uh, so from day one, we've been talking about how do we how do we partner together? How can we work together to address the person that comes in for a mental health appointment, but they may also have some physical uh, problems as well or other health needs. And so we, we we're talking about it. And then the, this the opioid. Uh, epidemic happened, and it almost forced us to get together and address this problem. So, so just talking about it now for the first time, we're actually getting together. So I, I've, thought, I've seen that as a huge benefit to this disaster called the, the opioid epidemic. Right. And that's, that's the whole point of population health, is that we focus on these outcomes and health improvement for certain uh, issues um, in a collaborative, partnered, merged, shared effort. Um, and that, you know, as resources get make it tighter, that we it will require us to work together more. Um, and to the point about cause of death and other data, I highly encourage um, everyone to go to our website and click on the data tab. We're standing up new data sources all the time, including a new um, causes of death, which is at the locality level. I guess as um, uh, we prepare to close, I know people are, are starting to leave us, so uh, we'll go ahead and close up. But, you know, as supervisors or as counties, I think that we um, uh, we really need to work more closely with uh, the directors of our um, of the um, our district directors uh, of the health uh, departments because um, you know I know from from uh, talking to to ours uh, he's been able to give us in, uh, a lot of insight and uh, he sat down with our county attorney and went over some things that we can start in our in our community and so in our county and so that's what I think all of our counties need to do is to reach out and make sure that we're working in conjunction with you. We come up with some good ideas, but we need to know that they are based on, on uh, where you all see us going because you all have a lot of the data also. So um, I would like to see that happen. Um, as most of you all know, this is part of my initiative as the president of ACO, um, where we're looking at healthy uh, uh, counties, uh, Virginia healthy counties, and um, I am just so thankful that you all could come out and, and uh, speak on this and um, we will have, we have recorded it, so I know that it will be available um, later for people to actually listen to. There's some information, I believe, that we're going to be sending out to those that attended. And I just want to thank everyone who attended this uh, webinar. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Thank you.